about. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of Galatians. Ah, I need a Kleenex before I ever get started. My wife's prepared for me too. Thank you. Well, I'm going to use yours. I don't care. That's too much to handle before you stand up and, and try to do this. This is... Um, this morning's message is, a, is an interesting text. It's, it's, a, it's one of those texts that you almost would use the adage, it's a dirty job, but somebody has to do it. Preaching text. Because of the nature of the text and the subject matter in the text. And you will see that as we move along this morning. So I have prayed diligently before standing before you this morning to present this in a, in a manner as God would indeed have me do it, in that it would be honorable, but, but, honorable, but at the very same time uh, would truly inform us of the truth it is contained. This morning's message is works of the flesh versus the fruit of the Spirit. I want to begin reading in verse 16, and I want to read all the way through verse 26 of Galatians chapter 5. Paul begins this section by saying, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with His passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit... Let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. In these verses, Paul continues his correction and instruction to his Galatian audience, or I might say audiences, by way of using comparisons in his defense of the doctrine of justification, which you know from our study in Galatians over the last year or so, in defense of the doctrine of justification, which is the theme of the epistle, Paul has repeatedly empo- employed comparisons to argue his point. His point is that justification is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. Thank you for singing the song this morning, In Christ Alone. For example... He opens the letter by comparing the gospel taught by the Judaizers or the circumcision party as a different gospel. He calls it a different gospel. He compares their their gospel to the true gospel of Christ that he preached to them. He goes on to compare faith to works of the law as a means of justification. He compares the law to the promise. He compares slaves to sons. He compares two women, Hagar and Sarah, two sons, Ishmael and Isaac, and two covenants. He compares circumcision and uncircumcision. So you see how he has used comparisons in his argument. So as we saw last time, Paul compares walking by the Spirit to gratifying the desires of the flesh. We see that in verse 16, our opening verse where he says, if you walk by or walk in the Spirit, you will not indulge the sinful nature or indulge the flesh. So there's a comparison. 
Paul makes his point very clear in verses 16 through 18 is the reason why I backed up and read those verses that these two ways of living, which is Paul's meaning behind the use of the word walk. Remember, I told you that the word walk is used primarily by Paul to speak. Of. In fact, in the New Testament in general, it's used to speak of the way a person behaves themselves or conducts themselves. So that these two ways of living are plainly contradictory. A person cannot claim to be led by the Spirit and at the same time be indulging the desires of the flesh. It's just, it's just not possible. It's contradictory. In verse 17, Paul explains precisely why when he writes this. In verse 17 of chapter 5 of Galatians, he says, For, which means because, the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. Here's the reason why they cannot operate together. The desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit against the flesh. Now listen to what he says next. He says, For these are opposed to each other to keep you, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Now the word desires that you see there in the English Standard Version that you might very well have before you is translated lusteth in the King James Version. And the Greek word is epithumia. It's an interesting word because it's from a Greek root word, thymus, which means an urge or a passion. To give you an idea of where it came from in Jewish thought, which is likely you think about Paul writing this, even though he's writing to primarily a Gentile or to Gentile congregations, he's still writing from even though he's under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, from somewhat his Jewish orientation. So in his Jewish mind, this is likely what he is thinking, is that, that it denotes an impulsive, sensual desires contrary to the will and pleasure of God. Let me repeat that. Impulsive, sensual desires contrary to the will and pleasure of God. In the New Testament, Epithemia constitutes, in fact, wrong sensual and even wrong sexual desires that are selfish and result in disobedience to God. That's a strong word. In fact, whenever in a Greek word you see the prefix epi, it accentuates it. It actually adds because you got thumos meaning desire. And so now you've had epi to the word thumos. So you have epithemias. And all of a sudden you have an intensive desire, a driving passion. And that's the, that's the use of the word there. And so that is exactly what he is thinking. In fact, according to Romans 124, willfully disobedient persons, willfully disobedient persons are given up by God. This is in the scriptures. I'm not making this up. Given up by God to perverse desires. And that Greek word there is epithumia. The very same word. They're given up to perverse desires of their hearts. Christians are admonished, listen church, admonished to abandon and change their formal sinful behavior in which they once followed and performed. That is carried out. That is the lust of the flesh. Amen. Now you got to remember what Paul is dealing with here. Again, I've told you that Paul is writing primarily, the Galatian church is plural. This is, I said this from the very beginning, the book of Galatians or the letter to the Galatians is not a letter to a particular one church location. This is a circular letter, which meant this letter was written and then circulated throughout several churches within the, in Galatia or Asia Minor. And so there would be a courier of some type that would go to the various churches taking this letter because the, their, the problem that the Galatians were facing was just not located in one local body. It is spread by virtue of the circumcision party spreading their false teaching to all the churches throughout this area. So there were overwhelmingly a large number of Gentiles, even though we know there were Jews in those congregations as well. Think with me for a moment. Where did these Gentile believers come from? They came right out of paganism. They came right out of heathenism. They came right out of living completely, absolutely void 
of any true knowledge of God, probably polytheism and everything you can possibly imagine, they practiced. And so Paul had already instructed them, evidently, because he tells us here, had previously instructed that there's certain things that you may have once participated in and that you have may at once practice, but those are the things you can no longer practice or participate in because something's happened. You've changed. You have come to faith in Jesus Christ. You are to abandon. You are to change that formal sinful behavior that which you used to live, you can no longer live. Now, Romans 6.12, for example, just give you some biblical examples. In Romans 6.12, Paul writes this. He says, let not sin, therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions, as the English Standard Version translates it. You know what that passions word is? It's epithemia. It's the very same word. To make you obey its lust. To make you obey its passions. Don't let it rain in your body making you do that. In Ephesians 2, 3, Paul writes again. He says, among whom we all once lived in the passions of the flesh, carrying out the desires, epithumia, of the body and the mind, and were by nature, because we did those things, listen to what Paul says, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Two more. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22. He tells, instructs his Ephesian readers. Now, you have to know, know the history of Ephesus and the wickedness and sexual immorality in that city, much like Corinth. But he says to them, he says, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, epithemia. 1 Thessalonians 4, 4 and 5. Let each one of you know how, listen to Paul's instructions here, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust, epithemia, like the Gentiles who do not No, God. So as believers, those who do know God, what are we to do? We are to control our bodies. We are to control our desires. We are to control our passions. You can also see Titus 3.3 and 1 Peter 1.14 and 1 Peter 4.2 and 3. Further examples of this. But it makes perfect sense, if you really think about this, it makes perfect sense to a truly... And I want to qualify this. I'm trying to move quickly because I have a lot to cover, but I don't want to move too quickly that you miss something I believe is important. It makes perfect sense, if you think about it, to a truly regenerate person that the desires... Notice I said truly regenerate person. I didn't just say a person that professes some type of belief. I'm saying a truly regenerate person that the desires, the lust of the sinful nature, which is what that word, which that word sarx literally means, which we interpret flesh, and our text literally means the sinful nature. It makes total, total sense to us that the desires, the lust of the sinful nature are in opposition to or against the Spirit. That is not the little s, that is uppercase s, the Spirit of God, which is in us. And likewise, the Spirit is against the, against the flesh. I say this because sadly, sadly, many professing Christians do not seem to understand the dichotomy. They don't see it. Christians do not see, seem to understand that. The warfare between the spirit and the sinful nature is exactly the reason for Paul's warning in verse 13. As I've said repeatedly, our freedom, our liberty in Christ is not a license to continue or even to return to the old ways of the sinful nature, which I have had these conversations multiple times with people. Well, this is what I do in the body, in the spirit. That's the untouchable part of me. So what I do in the flesh really doesn't matter because what really matters is my spirit. You have no understanding 
Such a person has no understanding of the real nature of our existence, as if somehow they can dichotomize what I do here is over here, what I do here is here, and the two somehow have no interaction with each other. And so what happens is when they come to this newfound faith in Christ, they understand the liberty that is ours in Christ, this liberty somehow becomes a license to them to not only go back to, but to continue what they were doing before they ever came to Christ. And Paul says, no, 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 no. It's not, it's not that way. It's not that way at all. As I've also said, I don't believe a truly regenerate person can be comfortable, listen, can be comfortable in gratifying the sinful nature. Why? A truly regenerate person cannot be comfortable in gratifying the sinful nature because of the presence of the Holy Spirit in the believer. And Paul has already told you that what is the Holy Spirit's reaction toward our flesh, toward our sinful nature? It is opposed. He is opposed to that. So how can we be comfortable, at ease, when we're indulging the flesh, when the Spirit of God is Himself opposed to those very things we are practicing? I not only believe such a person, a believer that may behave this way, I I, I believe they are convicted, I believe they're not only convicted inwardly of His and her sin, which indeed we are, because I'm, listen, I'm not saying this morning that I don't believe a believer can fall into the sin or these sins. Absolutely, they can. What I am saying is they cannot abide in these sins because of two things. The misery it causes them as regenerate people and the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit that convicts them. And ultimately... Ultimately, in the life of a genuine, truly regenerate person, they're going to come out of this. It's going to break them. It's going to break them to the point of truly calling out to God for help in that area and finding God's deliverance. But I not only believe such a person, a believer that may behave this way, is convicted inwardly, but is miserable as well. Such misbehavior, and that's really what it is on the part of a believer, does something very significant that we're told of in Ephesians 4.30. It grieves the Holy Spirit. It grieves the Holy Spirit. And we are told not to do that. So we give thought to our actions and our behavior. Am I about to do something that I know will not only cause me intense personal misery, but is this action going to grieve God's Spirit? Now, in context, if you look, and we'll look at this more in just a moment, this is in regard to sexual immorality. This is, very, this is a very, very, very serious issue. Paul gives this a lot of attention. Paul was not obsessed with sexual thoughts in his writings, not at all. He was dealing with real, tangible problems on those he had brought the gospel to. They were struggling with these very things, and he knew the devastation, as we're going to see, um, what these sins can do in a person in a believer's life. And so he, on every front, every opportunity he was afforded, he warned them, he instructed them, he rebuked them, he admonished them, he did everything he possibly could to get them out of that. Let's get back to the text. Because of the conflict between the Spirit and the flesh, and the flesh and the spirit. A conflict, by the way, I bet if I took a survey this morning that we would all raise our hands and say we are familiar with. I would dare say, and I think I'm not stepping out on a limb by saying this, that that includes all of us. And it's okay to say amen, church. (laughs) That includes every single one of us. There's a conflict we are all familiar with, and we are often kept, as Paul says here, from doing the things we want to do, those things that we know are pleasing to God, those things that we know are holy. The inherent, the inherent weakness of our flesh, our residual sin nature, strives to keep us from doing that which is pleasing to God. Have you experienced that before? It has really been, I mean, you you have desired, you've wanted more than anything to just continue 
in, in a way that you know is pleasing to God. And there's this struggle, there's this warfare that you're experiencing. Let me tell you, you're not alone. And not only are you accompanied by those sitting to your left or your right behind you or in front of you, the Apostle Paul himself, the author of this text, was familiar with the very struggle he's talking about here. He addresses it very explicitly in his letter to the Roman believers in Romans chapter 7, verses 7 through 25, especially in verses 15 through 23. Look, in fact, that's, I, I know I've got limited time this morning, but I want you to see this. I was going to move on, but I can't. I can't skip this. And I want you to turn to Romans chapter 7, look at verses 15 through 23. Romans 7, 15 through 23. For I do not understand. Now listen to this. He says, for I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Sound familiar, folks? Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of the spirit or the law of sin that dwells within or dwells in my members. Now some attempt to argue Paul is addressing his pre-conversion state. Now, as many of you may recall, or you may recall from our exposition of Romans, I argue that's not the case at all. Paul's not addressing his behavior before coming to Christ. The language in there is clearly evident of a person who has come to faith in Christ and yet recognizes there's still a struggle in the sinful nature. So there are solid reasons, in fact, to believe that Paul is indeed speaking of his presence, ex present experience and post-conversion state, still wrestling with the conflict of his own residual sin nature. See, we've got this idea because he authored the New Testament under the inspiration of the Spirit that he glows in the dark and walks six inches off the ground. He was a man, <laughs> just like us, living in the same world as we live confined to the same flesh we are confined to, dealing with the same sinful nature that every single man has dealt with since Adam, still working in him. Paul labored. In fact, it was a labor on the part of Paul. He tells us this, and I'll give you the instances here. Paul labored to keep his own sinful passion and impulses in check. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, we see that. Knowing they could, in fact, disqualify him. He said, I, I keep these things in check so that I somehow don't disqualify myself from the calling that God has on me to preach the gospel. And I have to work daily on keeping those things subject to the grace and the Spirit of God in my life. Listen to what Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 13. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if, you, if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Strong language. As believers, let me tell you something. Kind of help you out this morning. As believers, we owe the sinful nature nothing. We owe the sinful nature nothing. No loyalty, no friendship, no participation, no camaraderie. 
we owe it absolutely nothing. Only our interaction with, our, with the sinful nature is to be this. It is to be putting it to death. Daily putting it to death. In fact, the Scottish theologian David Brown wrote this. He said, if you don't kill sin, sin will be killing you. And you've heard me say this to you before. Give The old adage that says, give it an inch and it'll take a mile. No, give it an inch and it will take your life. Rather than indulging it, rather than flirting with it, rather than entertaining it, we are to deal it a death blow. We are to put it to death along with its deeds, all the works. Now look at verse 18 of text in Galatians. And verse 18 says, But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Here is the remedy for the proclivity, the inclination to indulge the flesh. Paul says, be led by the Spirit. Be led by the Spirit. Do we have that daily communion and communication with the Spirit of God? He has been, as I've said to you just a week or two, well, it wasn't last week because I wasn't here. It had to be two weeks ago. He is almost the unforgotten member of the Godhead in many evangelical circles. Either he is the one who is abused the most by blaming things on him that he's not responsible for, or in the other other extreme, he is the one who is ignored by evangelicals for fear of being like those who abuse him. And yet I call him the the most forgotten or ignored member of the Godhead. We kind of come to faith in Christ. We know that's by the Spirit of God. We're regenerated by the Spirit. The Spirit comes and lives within us. And at that point, we kind of move him to the back burner. Now we take it with what we know to do and, and believe in it we know to do. And that is not the case. To be led by the Spirit means to be in communion with the Spirit. It means to be in communication with the Spirit recognizing that if I'm going to be able to stand in my faith in Jesus Christ today, I am going to need the Spirit's power. I'm going to need His presence, and I'm going to need His power. I'm going to need to be led by the Spirit. In fact, in verse 16, Paul instructs his readers to walk by the Spirit. Here he says to be led by the Spirit. Both of these expressions are likely synonymous and mean the Spirit's influence and the Spirit's guidance. We've got to have it. We've got to have it. Don't, don't negate the importance. Don't ignore the significance and importance of the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit with us. I'm going to drive this home more in just a moment. I have said to you before, some accuse us because we don't believe believe in particular manifestations of the Spirit, that we somehow don't have the Spirit, or we don't believe in the Holy Spirit. You know that church over there, they don't believe in the Holy Spirit. Oh yes, we do. In fact, the very fact that we are here today, the very fact that we are walking in faith in Christ is the work of the Spirit. He is with each and every one of us who have truly come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. And now Paul is prepared to give a list of what he calls the works of the flesh. And this is where it gets to be not so much fun. The Greek word translated works, if you look at verse 19, he says, Now, The works of the flesh are evident. Pay attention to that first phrase. The works of the flesh are now evident. The Greek word translated works is just a normal Greek word used for work or works. Ergon, you know we get the word energy from that. Ergon is the Greek word. And it essentially means actions or deeds. And so here Paul uses the word with an obviously negative connotation. They are deeds or actions associated with the flesh, meaning the sinful nature. Now, as we'll see as we move through these, as some commentators have suggested, we can classify, there's 15 of them, and you can classify them in four divisions. And don't worry, we are not going to deal with 15 this morning. We do have lunch, And that's not an intermission. This is going to be it this morning. 
But there are, you can take those 15 works of the flesh and you can divide them into four categories. And I'll say more about that in a moment. But first, I want you to notice what Paul says about these works of the flesh. He says they are evident. Now, the King James translates the Greek word used here as manifest. And this is, in fact, the King James Version gives a very accurate translation because phanera, which is the Greek word which we, which we get from phanero, means making something visible or known which was not previously or readily seen. And so in that sense, it is manifest. The potential problem, at least from my perspective, with evident as the way the, King, the English Standard Version translates it, translates it, is it may be interpreted as meaning that now suddenly all these works or deeds of the flesh are being committed publicly out in the open for everybody to see. We know this is not necessarily the case. Not all these are committed publicly, at least immediately. What Paul likely means is this, that these works of the flesh or deeds of the flesh are not the new nature given by God to believers at regeneration. This is not what is supposed to be present in a believer's life. This is a pretty extensive and descriptive list. However, with this said, as we well know, such deeds, such works do not lie hidden for long, do they? In fact, we often tell all our kids, I mean, when, when suddenly one day we... We, we, we may not catch them with their hand in the cookie jar, but we go to the cookie jar and it's empty. And we go looking for our kids. And, and they're looking at us with their cheeks about this big and crumbs coming down. Mommy! And then we all of a sudden say, Surely your sins will find you out. <laughs> and indeed, they did. And again, I bet you, if I were to do my proverbial survey and ask us how many times in our lives, maybe not to this extent, hopefully, but that our sins have indeed been made manifest. I can do... Listen, this is going to sound funny. I hope this doesn't offend anybody. But I have been given a precious gift. And that precious gift is sitting right here on the front row. And, well, you know that. That's not not going to offend anybody. But the gift is that She is the backup as if God needed one to make sure that I stay on the straight and narrow. In fact, so much so that you remember this, baby. Years ago, some ladies in our church made her a sheriff's badge and said, Deputy Holy Spirit. (laughs) She didn't wear it. But the point was well taken. They knew. I mean, and you know, there's I, I can do. No, I mean, I can, I can do something. I'm not saying something sinful, but I can do something that maybe immediately I don't want her to know. And I take all the precautions to do it and make sure I've got everything done and out of the way. She's not home five minutes. Oh, so Federal Express brought you something today. How did you know that? <laughs> or you cook so-and-so for lunch. How do you know that? Surely. Your sins will find you out. So there is in one sense, I guess you could say, where they may not be immediately evident, but they may eventually be evident. They may not eventually be committed in public, but later you committing them will be made public. With this said, As we well know, such deeds, such works don't lie hidden long. Now, the second part of verse 19, which for your pleasure to let you notice when this is as far as we're going to go. Paul, in the first part of verse 19, Paul gives or first lists three of the 15 works of the flesh. These three make up what we might consider the first of the four categories. In fact, here are the three Paul lists in the first category. Sexual immorality, and you know, sexual immorality, impurity, and sensuality. 
So these are deeds related to moral infidelity or moral uh, corruption, you might want to say. So let's, let's look at these. And this is where it gets very, very touchy. Not because it's something we should not address, but I do want to be, I want to be extremely careful and at the same time very clear in what I honestly, truly believe the text is teaching us. So here you have number one. Let's look at sexual immorality. There are many places today where you'd even say those two words together and suddenly people start squirming in their seats. The Greek word translated sexual immorality, and there's only one word, by the way, in the Greek that translates those two words in our English Standard Version, is the word pornea. Now, does that word sound familiar to you? It should because it is the Greek word that we get the word pornography from. It's the root word for our word pornography. And so the word group, if you were to do a word study on the word group of pornea, it belongs generally to any kind. Now listen very carefully. I'm going to slow down. The word group which pornea belongs generally to is any kind of illegitimate sexual intercourse, adultery, and fornication. In fact, as it's listed in the King James Version. So Paul's point is clear. Such actions are products, deeds, and works of the sinful nature. You see, sexual immorality was an especially bothersome issue in the early church, especially as the church experienced growth among, as I told you in the very beginning, experienced growth among the Gentiles who were formerly pagan. Paganism is, well, you know, I don't need to tell you. Paganism is wrought, wrought with sexual immorality. Its whole foundation of practice is sexual immorality. Everything about it is sexually oriented. All its ceremonies, all its practices, everything about it is focused on one thing, focused on sexual immorality. That's where its whole attention is given. There's so much I could say, but I'm just not going to stay there this morning. And so these are the kind of people that, whose lives have been affected by this stuff prior to listening to the gospel and coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Sexual immorality was rampant, rampant, not much different from our culture today. I believe it is safe to say, I, I honestly with all my heart believe it is safe to say that we live in a sexually charged culture. And it is becoming increasingly sexually charged. Everything around us. I mean, I, we were, I, I've shared with some of the men that Terry and I have found a new, new interest together before we go to bed at night. We, we, of course, we do the no, normal things, but we will watch an episode of Perry Mason. Because we're, so, we're just so interested to see who's he going to get this time. And, and amazingly, one of the episodes that we saw about a week or so ago was a guy, about a guy who was transitioning his magazine from a family-oriented home-type magazine to a more promiscuous type of magazine. And it showed the, literally showed, which was promiscuous for the time, on the TV, because this was 1960, when this episode was filmed, it showed three women in shorts and a t-shirt. <laughs> showing nothing. And, and, and when, the, when the guy unmasked it in his office, all the people in the office, oh! And I looked at her and I said, what a change. What a drastic, if that was seen as something then, oh my goodness, what they would say today. We live in a sexually charged culture. So you see, this is not 2,000 years apart from us as a church. This is not, too, we're not separated 2,000 years and a different continent, a different culture from this stuff. We are this morning sitting right in the middle of that. So Paul deals with this issue in his other epistles as well, especially 
in his letter to the church at Corinth. They had sexual immorality in their midst. In fact, they had sexual immorality. Paul says that is not even readily and openly discussed among the Gentiles. That's wickedness. And he had to deal with it. And he dealt with them as Christians. He called them brothers. So he saw that this was still working in their midst. Even though they had come to faith in Christ, they were still having to deal with it. And he rebuked them. His rebuke is, in fact, pretty stern in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 10-11. through 11. Paul's stand against sexual immorality is fervent. He's adamant about this stuff. So fervent, in fact, that he calls for its, total, its total eradication from the believer's life. Using, as we saw earlier, the analogy of death. Colossians 3, 5 puts it this way. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Put to death what is earthly in you. And what is the very first thing he mentions in Colossians 3, 5? Sexual immorality. The very first thing he mentions when he says put to death what is earthly in you, he immediately follows it up, sexual immorality, pornea. Why? Is sexual immorality, sexual sin so heinous? Why is it so egregious? The Scripture explains why to us. Number one is, let me tell you something. Sex is sacred. Sex is sacred. Sexual intercourse between a man and a woman is meant by God to be carried on in the confines of marriage. You can say amen. Don't let that shock you. That may shock a lot in our culture today, but that, that's, that's shocking to some. In fact, their heads spin three times when you say that. Such a sexual relationship outside of marriage is clearly, church, I, I'm not making this up. You know that. You've read your Bible. Such a sexual relationship outside of the boundaries and confines of marriage is called fornication. And should not be practiced by professing believers. Plain and simple. I realize this is unpopular. It's an unpopular position today. Our value of the sexual union of a man and a woman has been demeaned by our culture. In fact, now all you need is love. 1 Corinthians 6.13b, we read this. Paul says the body is not meant for sexual immorality. I mean, how, how clear can you be? He says the body is not meant for sexuality, for sexual morality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Sexual intercourse, according to Scripture, is two bodies, two people becoming one flesh. We see that all the way back in the very beginning in Genesis when Adam knew his wife. But even prior to knowing her, that when God gave her to him, he said, now these two shall become what? One flesh. Who performed the first wedding? God. Who defines the meaning of a marriage? God. you got to know that. Especially in the day. Isn't it amazing that when we have just been redrafting our doctrinal statement as a church, that is now in our Constitution, which you'll be getting a copy of the new Constitution bylaws. In that, we have had to add in our Constitution and in our bylaws a new article defining how we define marriage. Who would have ever thought that 30 years ago? But we've had to do that legally to protect ourselves as a church. Yet, we are told that as believers, we are also joined to the Lord. So see, I am joined to my wife. We are one flesh, but at the very same time, I am joined to the Lord, one spirit with Him. I am one body with her. I am one spirit with the Lord. Would he who, who professes to be one with Christ, listen, spiritually join their physical bodies to a person that we are not covenanted to in marriage? The answer should be negative. No. Sexual sin is bad because other sins, the Scripture tells us, are committed outside the body. 
And this is not the case with sexual sin. This is why it's so important to Paul. People ask me all the time, well, do you believe that one sin is worse than another sin? And my answer is always, sin is sin. However, all sins are not the same on the level of a violation and on the level of consequences. And sexual sin certainly is one of those. And there's a reason why. Sexual sin is especially this way because other sins of the Scripture tells us are outside the body, which isn't so with sexual sin. Sexual sin is sin against one's own body. The problem with this church is just as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. He says, do you not know your body is? This is exactly the context. Listen, do you not know your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Whom you have from God? You are not your own. Get that. This is, I, I live here, but this is not mine. Who owns this? God owns this. I am owned by Him. How do I know that? Because Paul tells me in verse 20, For you were bought with a price. I was bought with a currency that exceeds all currencies known to man. It is the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ has bought me, has bought you. I am not my own. You are not your own, believer. You are His. You have been bought with a price. And what are you therefore to do? He says, so glorify God in your body. Are you sweating as much as I am? Sexual sin and sexual immorality has a way of internally destroying a person like no other sin. Dr. MacArthur comments in his commentary on the Corinthians passage in Corinthians 6, he says this, a short sentence, he says, because sexual intimacy is the deepest unity of two persons, and it is, its misuse corrupts on the deepest human levels. End of quote. A believer who commits sexual immorality or is trapped in its sinister web is in great peril. It is not something to flirt with. It is not something to play with. His misery caused by such corruption on the deepest human level is compounded, as I said earlier, by the conviction of the Holy Spirit. A person who claims to be a Christian and participate. Listen, a person who claims to be a Christian and still participates in sexual immorality with no inner misery and no Holy Spirit conviction, biblically, I would ask, are they a truly regenerate person? Why? Why do I make that? That's a bold statement, Mitch. Here's the reason. Paul's already told you. Sexual immorality is in opposition to the Spirit. And the Spirit opposes sexual immorality. As I said earlier, sexual sin grieves the Holy Spirit of God. It graphically, sexual immorality graphically displays... Now, just, just think through this with me and see if this is not indeed the case. Sexual immorality graphically displays self-centeredness. Self-gratification. Are those, are those characteristics of the Spirit of God? No. They are, in fact, characteristics of an unregenerate person. Selfishness and self-gratification. It dishonors Sexual immorality dishonors those made in the image of God. Sexual sin, sexual sin affects others, not just the one sinning. Oh, it's my body. I'll do with it what I want to do. Well, if you're a Christian, first of all, you've already heard what? It's not your body. And secondly, don't believe the lie that what you do only affects you. And as I've already said, it violates God's order for marriage. I'm almost done. 
Paul's answer for the problem, he gives you an answer. In 1 Corinthians 6, 18, it's complicated. You ready? I mean, this, get ready. It's going to be an extensive writing exercise for you. This is a very, a very complicated remedy. Are you ready? Flee from sexual immorality. Period. Flee from sexual immorality. If I'm walking down a path and a 450 pound grizzly bear steps out of the woods and begins to run toward me, I am not going to pause and say, I wonder how close he can get and I still outrun him. Well, I may not immediately run because I'll probably drop dead of shock, but if I don't, no one's going to have to yell, run. Because I am going to immediately turn and I am going to run hoping the road doesn't rise up to meet me. And if I'm with you, I'm not even worried about outrunning the bear. I'm only worried about outrunning you. No one has to tell us to flee. Flee sexual immorality. When it presents itself. Do you notice what I said, church? I didn't say if it presents itself. What did I say? When it presents itself. And it will. Flee. Recognize it immediately for what it is. And flee. Get away from it as quickly as you possibly can can. In 1 Thessalonians 4.3, Paul writes, he says, for this is the will of God. Your sanctification. What does God, oh pastor, I want to know God's will. I got it for you. Your sanctification. But then he doesn't stop merely. He doesn't say, this is the will of God, your sanctification, period. Listen again to what Paul writes. He just, he just drives this point home and home and home over and over again. He says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, period. In other words, what is it in Paul's estimation? That could be a fundamental and foremost obstacle to your sanctification is if you continue in sexual immorality. This is no doubt, church, a significant work of the flesh that Paul deals with over and over again. And it probably very likely is one of the most significant ones the church deals with today. I can close in five minutes. In the first group of, three, of the three works, sexual immorality being the first, the other two also have to do with violations of personal purity. Look at what they are. They don't even require a lot of commentary. Flowing right into the vein of sexual immorality, the next two works of deeds of the flesh that He gives us are impurity and sensuality. Impurity. Akatharsia in the Greek is an interesting word. The word was used early on to denote ceremonial uncleanness, but later began to be used for moral uncleanness. That's the way Paul uses it. It is a word that connotes moral filthiness. It's used the way, this way in the New Testament as associated with sexual immorality. From the context we gather, Paul is expounding moral purity as it relates to sexual purity. A sexually immoral person has, by what we glean here, a serious issue in the core of their character. There's impurity somewhere at the very core of their being. That's why you have to put it to death. But Paul's not done. He says sensuality. This is our last one. The Greek word aselgia. An interesting word here, aselgia. Often translated in the New Testament, in the King James Version, as debauchery. It literally means lewdness, licentiousness, even promiscuity. It is the work of the flesh that accompanies the other sexual sins of overindulgence. So you see how they work together. Sexual immorality, impurity, and sensuality. They kind of flow like, like a, a river here. 
It's the work of the flesh that accompanies those. In my estimation, for whatever that's worth, this is one that is most evident. Now listen carefully to me. This is one that is most evident. People with this problem are often the ones to make lewd or indiscriminate sexual comments or innuendos at a drop of a hat. We have to be careful. That happening happening repeatedly and repeatedly with the same individual could very well indicate there's something at the core of that person's being that they got a problem with. Sexual innuendos, lewd comments, improper comments are evidences of this work of the flesh working in that person's life. Their jobs, I'm sorry, their jokes and can't read more writing. Their jokes and honor. I'm sorry, I'll get it out in a minute. Their jokes and humor. I'll get my own writing here. If you had to read this cursive, you'd be in bad trouble too. Their jokes and their humor are often crass. Does any of us know anybody like that? Is that us? Oh. They're crass at times, hinting, maybe even not so subtly of their, of their, sinful, of their sensual nature. Like the other sexual sins, sensuality is a horrible vice. Horrible vice. And maybe a a sign of something going on inside of a person, moral depravity and corruption that really need they need to deal with. Let me tell you, can I just interject something practically here, church? We are to correct one another. We are to do it in love. We are to do it in fear and trembling, lest we ourselves fall prey to the very same thing. But if we have a brother, or even a sister for that matter, that this is what seems to be congruous with their behavior, we need to call them out on it privately. Call them out. Pull them to the side. Express your concerns. And back it up. And hopefully, as Galatians 6 says, as we'll see in a moment, you will have restored your brother. You would have done something wonderful in that person's life. Don't let them get away with that. Come on. Are we, are, are we to be our brother's keeper? Come on, help me. Yes, we are. In Romans 13, 13, Paul tells, us, tells believers to walk properly, behave yourself, watch your conduct. He says, not in sexual immorality and sensuality. In 2 Corinthians 12, 21, he warns those who have failed to repent of the impurity, sexual immorality, and sensuality they have practiced. Repent of those things, he says. Paul tells his Ephesian readers in Ephesians 4, 19, that is the Gentiles, not true believers, who are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God, and have given themselves up to sensuality. Greed to practice every kind of impurity. And one last reference. 1 Peter 4, 3. Listen to what Peter says. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. In other words, that time is gone. It's gone. Living in sensuality, passions, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. He's saying, church, that time is gone. That's not our lives. That's not who we are. It's not who we're to be. I know this is not a popular position in our day for sure. And there might, I might even meet some criticism from someone here. I hope not. Or from someone who's listening to us today. However, it's the very thing that separates us, that is, distinguishes us from the culture around us. There should not be a hint of those things mentioned among us. Amen. The church should never, no one outside the church should ever look inside the church and say, that's their problem. No. It is as Peter goes on to say in verse 20, the very grounds of the culture maligning us. They'll, they'll, they'll say things ugly about us, but that's not supposed to be among the things. So Paul opens his list with the works of the flesh, with pornea, sexual immorality, acatharsia, impurity, and aselgia, passion, sensuality, or debauchery. And guess what? He's only started but I'm done. At least for today. Let's bow our heads.
Six minutes. I was one minute over what I promised you. Father, indeed, I, I'm, I am not oblivious to the difficulty of these passages as I have over the weeks and even months and actually years read, studied, preached, counseled these passages. Uh, they just, they never, they never grow old. They never grow dusty. They never grow insignificant nor irrelevant. They are, in fact, still as true today as they were the very day that the pen of the Apostle Paul, the ink of his pen was wet on the papyrus or whatever he wrote on. So Lord, I do pray that if there be any such thing, even working in us mentally, Perhaps there have not been sins that have been yet to carry out in the flesh, but perhaps those thoughts, those inclinations, those temptations, I pray today that one who hears that may be dealing with those things will know that they are to put those things immediately to death. And to call on you to draw from the strength of your Spirit, who is not outside of us merely to walk with us, but who lives inside of us to strengthen us, not just to strengthen us spiritually, but morally, that we might stand against the innuendos and the, and the drives and sensuality of our, our culture and follow after you in lives that are pleasing to you. For we know this is Your will concerning us. And that is our sanctification. Might it be accomplished in us, Father, as You continue to work by Your Spirit for our good and for Your glory. In Jesus' name, Amen.